Okay. So welcome to this new seminar from the Institute of Astrophysica de Andalusia. Uh, today we have um, uh, a talk about artificial intelligence in the uh, galaxy evolution research. And the seminar will be given by Ines Martinez Sosete. Probably most of you know, and also for people online, so let me introduce you. So Ines started his PhD in 2018 here in this institute, and he's a member of uh, the JPAS and the great uh, QSO collaborations. So his expertise lies on applying artificial intelligence algorithms to astronomical data. So his thesis is titled Identification and Characterization of the Mission Line Objects in JPAS with Artificial Neural Networks, Develop New Techniques Based on Machine Learning to Analyze the Properties of Galaxies. He's the leading author of several papers published in different, uh, in different journals in the field. And since his PhD defense in 2022, he has been working as a postdoc here at the AEA. And his last work, Exploring the Properties of Khalifa Galaxies with Contrastive Learning, has been presented in conferences at the European Astronomical Meeting. Uh, and today, she will be talking about artificial intelligence in the service of galaxy evolution research at the technology. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, let's check that everything works. Yeah, you have to click over it. Clicking, clicking, okay. Let's see if I find the pointer. Ah, it's here. Do you see the pointer? Let me see the pointer. Yes. Uh, well, okay, you can. Mm. No, but why is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, great. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you people are watching online. Um, it's been a time I wanted to, to give this seminar uh, because uh, when I, I did, did the PhD defense in 2022, it was, um, there was a congress here in Granada, so many people couldn't come. And I think this is a great opportunity uh, to serve to share with you um, the work that I've been doing. So um, I didn't want this anyway to be something super focused on, on the work that I've been doing. So I think it was much better to put everything in context. How is the field now nowadays and how my work uh, is linked to this uh, rapid change in this field. So this, this is gonna be like kind of of a review, but of course, it's gonna be biased to to the work that that I did. Okay, so so let's go through it. <clears throat> so as you as you probably know, um, astronomy has changed a lot in the last decades. Back in the days, uh, thirty years ago, if one was studying galaxies, they could knew by heart the the galaxies that were studied. But the situation now is much more uh, different because uh, we count data in, in terabytes. And this can be seen in this, in this plot on the left where data volume uh, of uh, modern astronomical surveys is plotted against the, the year from the first light. So here, what we can see is uh, exponential growth in, in data volume and complexity. So that implies that we need new techniques that are uh, faster and more efficient for analyzing this data and can actually eventually um, be able to, to uncover new physics. So um, at the same time, we, we had this, uh, this growing of astronomical data. There has been a, a revolution in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, so so the, in, the, in this revolution, the, this revolution happened in, in, in waves. And this, these waves happen first in the computer science field. And at some point they translate to the astronomical uh, field. So in this review uh, the, uh, that I just put there, um, the author argued that there are um, three waves that happen in, in, in in the, in the artificial intelligence applied to astronomy field. So the first wave 
uh, it's um, composed of papers. So this is, by the way, the, the, the amount of papers submitted per month as a function of the year with certain keywords in the either in the abstract or in the title. So the first the first wave it's um it's composed of papers that so of course the first papers that appear in astronomical literature that apply machine learning they were uh, based on simple models. So this is why you have uh, words like multilayer perception that are simple neural network. And then around 2016, 2017, it's the start uh, explosion of paper with words like convolutional neural network, artificial neural network. Um, so those uh, papers are actually, um, so all those works uh, use something called supervised learning algorithm. So even if this, this is split in two waves, actually we can group this to, to a same wave that we, we are gonna go supervised learning. In astronomy, and then there is a new wave that is appearing now that we are that is ongoing that is uh, composed of papers that instead of using this supervised learning they use something called unsupervised or self-supervised. So um, I found this very interesting because at the time I read the paper, um, ChatGPT didn't appear. Then ChatGPT came, and in this. In this paper, the author argued that there are going to be a new wave that is still to appear, and it will be based on, it will follow the trend that we saw in computer science with this generative AI model like ChatGPT and uh, uh, Midjourney, all those generative models we'll talk a little bit later. Um, okay, so let's go to the first wave and see some of the applications, and then I'll show you some of the work that I did in this within this wave. So first of all, what's supervised learning? Supervised learning is a technique using machine learning uh, with the goal of training an algorithm for just one specific task. So we don't want this to be super general, just we have something that we want to, to predict and we train the algorithm for that. And there are many, um, Many kinds of algorithms, the, the most popular ones are, are neural networks. This is a, a simple neural network. So you, you input some data, then the neurons produce, uh, do like um, non-linear transformation of the data up to an output that is what you wish uh, to obtain. Um, here I'm showing one of the first paper that actually uh, used uh, artificial neural network in astronomy. And the goal was to predict photometric redshift. So this is a long galaxy. You see the spectra, the spectrum, and then uh, these these red points are the photo the photometry measuring in the in in five bands. So the idea is, can we uh, from the photometry alone predict uh, the photometric redshift of galaxy? Uh, yes, the, the answer is yes, and this can be done with, with these uh, neural networks. Of course, there are other techniques like template fitting that can, can do this task, but uh, the advantage of uh, using uh, those, those algorithms is that once they are trained, um, in they, the inference time, it's, it's very low. So, so we can predict much, much, much faster than what the template fitting code can do. Um, this has been improving. This, this paper was back in 2002, I think. So people have still uh, worked in this, in this, uh, uh, with this goal of predicting photosees. Uh, in this case, for I, I, I'm putting here a couple of examples that used data from for the Subaru telescope with the same idea, producing photosee. Uh, the algorithm has become more complex because, for instance, in this paper on the left, they use Bayesian neural network. So the idea is not only to predict the photo redshift, but also predict uncertainties uh, of, of this photo C. And uh, on this paper on the right, instead of using the, the integrated photometry of the Sloan, they, they used the whole images to, to do this prediction. So in this, in this case, you use different uh, neural networks. They are called convolutional neural network because they, they use a set of convolutional layers that are applied to um, 
to the images and then uh, produce the, this, predict this, this, this red set. But you see, the idea is exactly the same. Uh, we want just to do one task and do it in the best possible way. And this is predicting photo, photosis in this case. There are many other applications within, within the field. Uh, this is something very common in, 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 the, in the field of galaxy evolution. One of the things we wish to, to have about galaxies is um, the morphology. So there are people that are training large convolutional uh, network to predict the different uh, galaxy types. And we find the universe. This can be done uh, like a multi-label classification with many classes, or you can just do a classification of, for instance, disk-like galaxies and bolts-dominated galaxies. But essentially, again, the idea is the same, to train an algorithm for a particular task. Uh, there are also samples in, in the star, in people's tiny stars. This, this paper, they use a Sloan, to, a Sloan images to produce RGB images of different star types. And then, uh, they train those are the convolutional neural network. They train one to do this uh, classification. There you can see the confusion matrix. This is a typical plot that people use to uh, to evaluate the performance of the algorithm. Um, so I was uh, when I started the PhD, there were many paper in, in this line, and um, we thought that this could be uh, a good idea to to apply these techniques to, to our problem. So I did the thesis on, on JPAS. So let me let me tell you uh, something about JPAS. Okay, so JPAS. JPAS is an astronomical survey. It's conducted in Interwell in Alhambra. This is an image of the observatory. So in this big telescope, 2.5 meter telescope, they install a, a super big camera called the GB cam. And this camera can take, uh, in one point, in, can, can observe the whole Andromeda galaxy. Um, JPAS is, so this each uh, square here is a CCD. So it observes the sky with, with filters in concrete 56 narrowband filters. So there on the right, you can see uh, a, a, an emission line galaxy, the spectrum of, of this galaxy, and how JBAS would look at this galaxy uh, with, with its narrowband filters. So uh, JBAS has the advantage of being kind of a low resolution uh, spectrograph, but at the same time, it can take pictures of the sky. Um, however, if you want to measure or predict the initial lines in galaxies, this is not uh, as straightforward as you could do in, in a spectroscopy because we cannot actually, you know, do something like a Gaussian fitting. So uh, machine learning is uh, uh, it's a good case here because we can train a network for predicting uh, the the, the, the equivalent width of those of those emission lines. So with with the points, we just want to to do this uh, this prediction. So what we did is we took uh, um, galaxies from from Khalifa and Manga. Those are integral field units. They observe galaxies as in, in a spatial resolved way. So we took those spectra. We produced um, synthetic J pass magnitude. And then uh, we train the neural network to predict the values of the equivalent width uh, of those lines. And then we test uh, our algorithms in, in a Sloan. Uh, here you can see some, some of the results we got in the simulation. On, on the y-axis, we are uh, is the, the prediction of the network. On the x-axis is uh, what you, you can measure directly in the spectra. So this is working kind of of good. Of course, there, there are um, there are situations where where the network struggle to, to do good prediction. And this happened in the regime where uh, galaxies are ionized by by AGNs or SUC. But in general, uh, 
we can have a first estimation of, of those initial lines. Uh, we applied this uh, this technique to a part of the uh, um, a small uh, data that was produced by, by the collaboration. It's called the mini J pass field. They installed a Pathfinder camera in the, in the telescope and took a one degree square um, of, of data in, in the northern sky. Um, so we applied this technique uh, to these galaxies and we were able to uh, predict um, the main ionization mechanism, this is the BPT on, on the left, and then also the, the star formation rates and recover the star formation main sequence. Um, so yeah, this this was great uh, because we could uh, do the first uh, analysis of mini j data, but uh, we have to be aware that there are many limitations intrinsic to this uh, uh, to this method because first we are training with synthetic data, and there is always uh, um, a gap between synthetic data and what you can uh, observe. So so there's a limitation there. Also, um, since galaxies are a different red set, for, for each red set, you have to train a different neural network because emission lines shift in the spectra. So we actually have to train like 300 neural network to do prediction in, in a general way. So I'll tell you a, a little bit in, in the end how to go through this limitation and produce something that is more general. But this is um, this is what we had at the time. Okay, so this is the first wave, uh, supervised learning astronomy. Then we have uh, what what I saw in the beginning, this red curve, that is unsupervised learning. So what is unsupervised learning? Um, unlike supervised learning, the idea here is not to uh, to build an algorithm that is able to do a particular task. But we want instead to build a representation space from which you can uh, perform a set of downstream tasks. Those are things that the algorithm hasn't been trained for it in the first place. So to build this representation space, there are many ways of doing that. This is an, uh, uh, an example. Uh, this is a very recent paper that uh, used uh, supernova data. And they use something called autoencoders. So what are autoencoders? You input here a, a spectrum. Then the network tries to compress this information up to a Latin space. This is done by the, enco the encoder. And then it tries to go back to the original space and reproduce the, the, the original data. So in this compression, uh, the algorithm has to take the, the most relevant features in the data. So if we look at this space, it's gonna be descriptive of our data. Um, of course, you can do this with other techniques, like for instance, principal component analysis, but the difference between PCAs and autoencoders is that PCAs are linear transformation of the data. So th this is not linear. And this, is, and this plot shows precisely that the autoencoders or variational autoencoders are able to, to reconstruct the spectra much better than what you can do with, with uh, PCAs. So once you get uh, uh, this compression, you can go to this Latin space, this plot in the middle, and, and look for, uh, well, those are, those are not physical dimensions, just the projections. But you can color code this with uh, properties that you know, like the uh, fraction of electrons in this case. And you see that each supernova, depending on, on this parameter, each supernova placed uh, in, in one region in this space. And one thing you can do is, OK, let's gather together supernova that are similar in this space and see a look at the spectra to see how it looks like. So they, they, they were able to produce clusters with supernova spectra of, of the safe. For me, this is 
Um, that doesn't tell me a lot because I don't know, I, I know very little about supernova, but maybe if you're working in the field, you, you can identify some, some particular uh, uh, spectra. So this, uh, those are encoders are not, uh, perhaps this is not the best way of compressing the information. And the reason is why, the reason is that they are not invariant to astrono to, mm, to instrumental effect in the data. So if we have a, a spectrum of, again, of a supernova, and then we have the same spectrum, but with more noise, those are the colors will put the spectra in different regions in the Latin space. And this is not ideal because those are actually the same. So they should be placed in the same place. Um, so in this paper uh, led by Gina Sargento, uh, they, they used uh, another technique that is called constructive learning. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Um, so they used the galaxies from, from the MANA survey. They they produce post-processing maps like the age of this of the of the uh, of the stellar population, the metallicity, and then uh, they try they compare the Latin space that you can get using PCAs or this could be similar like an autoencoder, and with this contrastive blending framework. And what you can see is that if you if you look at physical properties, like uh com like Contrastive learning and PCA, you find gradients there. So it, it depending on, on where the galaxy is, for instance, uh, it has uh, all uh, stars or it's composed of jump population of the stars, then the galaxy is placed in one region or another. And that's happened as well in the PCA, in the PCA uh, compression and in the in the oil compression. However, uh, when you look at other properties that are non-physical, like the number of fibers, you know that manga is observe the sky with, with different setup. So one setup is with, I think, 12 fibers or so. And then you have another setup that has much more fibers. So that tells you like the apparent size of the galaxy, but this is not physical. So it's something that related with the observation. So in, in this regard, PCAs, they uh, they separate points in function of this property that is non-physical, and this is something that uh, we we would like not to to, to have. Um, so what what is this technique that is more powerful in this sense? Uh, this is called as I, I said constructive learning. So the idea is the following: so you have uh, if we go back to galaxies, you have a galaxy. And then we apply a set of transformation that leave physics invariant. So which transformation can be? Like for instance, a rotation. If I rotate the galaxy, it's still the same galaxy. If I add Gaussian noise or no or some noise property, then it will be the same galaxy. You can do many, many transformations, like translation, resize, everything that you can imagine that doesn't touch the physics. And then you say to the network, okay, I want this original galaxy and the, its transformation pair to be projected to the same place because those, those things are the same, right? So um, the network is trained in, in, in this way. So similar galaxies will be put together while galaxies that are very different, they will put in, in, in in another in another uh, region, um, the first people that actually used this technique wasn't uh, the the paper. It wasn't the paper that I mentioned before. It was this one by Abu Layal in I think it was two thousand twenty one, and they use uh, Sloan galaxies, the images of uh, of the Sloan galaxies the, the, in, in the filters. They trained this this network, and then you can build those those diagrams here. Uh, and you see that depending on the physical properties, like whether a galaxy has a disk or is more like a pulse dominated, uh, the, it's placed in, in one region or another. Uh, also, there is gradient in, in the red set. So 
uh, what they argue in the paper is that once you build this diagram, then all the tasks that you do typically was doing were doing with uh, a specific uh, uh, algorithms can be performed from this diagram. So while I build this diagram, I can train I can train another algorithm to predict uh, photo redshift to predict uh, the the different uh, class of galaxies. Also, I can search for a similar object. Imagine that you are interested in one particular object. You have the diagram and go for, for the object that are nearby, the object that you are interested in. You can also search for anomalies in the data, galaxies that are completely different from the general distribution. This will appear naturally as, a, as, as an outliers in this diagram. So those are powerful. So when I was reading this paper, I, I started wondering whether we could do this uh, with Khalifa, with Khalifa galaxies. And uh, we wanted to do it in a way that the network doesn't see any any physical uh, uh, physical format. Because when, when this was done with Manga, for instance, they used post-processing maps. So they they analyzed this data with, physic, with physical uh, modeling. And then uh, they, they took the age of the stellar population or the metallicity and trained the network. And so actually the two diagram is meaningful, but they were fitting the algorithm in the first place with physically four maps. So could we do the same with just data as we observe it? So we took Khalifa. Mm, the, this is a new, uh, a new release where uh, the, sp the, the spatial resolution is uh, it's better. Uh, and it's like around 900 galaxies. So we we trained the algorithm to to us to do what uh, I just explained, and then we got uh, those maps. And here I'm colon calling the the galaxies with uh, with some properties. So on the left is the morphology, the the T type morphology. No, not T type. Sorry, it's uh, kind of a T type close. Uh, so zero means like galaxies like elliptical, then uh, one it's more irregular, spirals are irregular. Um, there I plot, I'm color coding with, with the mass, with, with the age and the metallicity. And you see that there's gradients in this, uh, in this uh, um, projection. But the network didn't know anything about physics, just the data. This is transformation of this data projection, and then the physics appears in a natural way. Um, so one of the things that we did is, OK, let's now cluster the data and see what we find. So in the case, this is two, uh, two clusters. The middle is three clusters, then four clusters. So when you cluster the data uh, in two, you find naturally the bimolar distribution that is found in the in, in in galaxies, a population composed of uh, of galaxies that are evolved. They they, they, they are no longer star formation going on, and then another population composed of galax spiral galaxies, uh, giant population, uh, etc. Um, if we look at the the one diagram, uh, this tells us the, the ionization mechanism. Again, the same story. If if you go to uh, to three cluster, you see that there is an intermediate population. So what is has been called the Green Valley also appears here as uh, galaxies with intermediate morphologies, uh, more with with uh, with with more ATNs. And then if you go to four clusters, things start to be more complicated to interpret. But the, the, the good point here is that just with the information of the data, we can get to the same conclusion that people uh, uh, got using physically modulated models. Well, this was just the, the morphology distribution of those clusters. Um, all thing we, we could do is, okay, once we have this, this, this diagram, then uh, we classify galaxies in different environments. Here we are differentiating between galaxies in voids, in clusters, 
and in, in filamental worlds, what sometimes is called field galaxies, and say, okay, let's look at the distribution of these galaxies in this diagram. Uh, if, uh, if the environment doesn't affect uh, the, the properties of galaxies, all those points were equally distributed in this plot, but this is not the case. Cluster galaxies tend to be here, like void galaxies a little bit there, field galaxies almost everywhere. So you can compare the distribution of this point in this diagram and conclude that those galaxies actually have different properties. But again, the network doesn't know anything about physics. Okay, so this is the end of the of the second wave, and I'm gonna drink because we are gonna we are going to the three wave, the third one. So what is going on now in the artificial intelligence field? Uh, a revolution is going on. There is an explosion of models that are called, that can be grouped with something called generative AI. So those models are able to produce different kinds of data like text, those are large language models like, like ChatGPT, Cloud, JAMA, that produce test from test, uh, but then there are others that produce images from a uh, from test description, like DALI or Midjourney. And then we have even uh, models like Lumiere or Sora that can produce videos from, from just a, a description, uh, a text description. And also up here, this, this last one, audio, this produces music. From a test description, and it, it's really good. I mean, uh, yeah. So those models um, they have in common that they are trained in in an unsupervised manner. If we think about ChatGPT, ChatGPT is not trained for uh, doing good summaries of text or translating documents. It's trained for predicting next token. How many times you said? Oh, okay. Um, so ChatGPT is trained for uh, predicting the next word in, in a phrase. And this is a very general uh, way of training. Then when, when you put enough data, um, the model can do all the tasks for which wasn't the uh, code in the beginning. Uh, those models serve two things uh, also. They are based on something called transformers. The formula were introduced uh, uh, in 2016 by, by, a, by a very famous paper uh, that was called Attention is All You Need by Google. And those transformers, they use uh, also this encoder decoder structure, but uh, they do an other different operation here in this, in this, uh, uh, in this encoder. And this, the, the, what they do is something called uh, an attention, attention mechanism. So what, what is an attention mechanism? So if you think in a phrase, if, you, if we think in, in language, uh, like this phrase, butterflies sold their wings because they no longer wanted to fly. So there is always connection between, for instance, the subject butterfly and the bird fly in this case. So the, what, what it does is attention mechanism is computing the similarity between each word in a phrase. And this seems to be very powerful to understand meaning in language. Um, here, this is like a matrix. So the attention, it's color code uh, with a bar. And uh, so what's the problem of this, of this attention mechanism? Uh, it is great, I mean, it works. Uh, Super good for those models, but uh, it's it grows with the square of n of the length of the phrase. So this is a kind of problem if you want to put a lot of data, and this is the reason why nowadays we cannot input to ChatGPT like the whole astronomical literature at once and ask for for a question, because this attention mechanism grows with with the length with the square of of of, of the of n. Um, nonetheless. This uh, this way of training the data 
can be can be useful for astronomy. And I want to simplify this with, 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 with these samples here. So ideally, what we would like to have is an observation, if, if we are studying galaxies, an observation in the whole ele electromagnetic spectrum. So this would be great because we can uh, know almost everything, right? So this is the cross match. But the cross match is very infrequent. It's happened for, for very little objects. If we could train an algorithm that doesn't uh, train on the cross match, but it trains on the on the U union, this would be great because we can benefit from from all the data. And this is sim this is somehow similar of the way that ChatGPT is training because sometimes it takes text that is a paragraph, sometimes it takes a text uh, a sentence or it's flexible in the in how you can fit, uh, you can put the data in, into a training. And this actually, uh, this has already been proposed by by those uh, by those people uh, in in what they call a foundational model. So it's called foundation mo foundational model because uh, it's training a very general way, and then uh, it has the potential to do uh, many 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 tasks. And what is more important is that it's trained not on the cross map, it's trained on the union. Um, so what, what they did here, they took uh, stars from, from Gaia, uh, from Apogee and two mass. So sometimes you have uh, stars observed by Gaia that were also observed by Apogee. And Apogee is great because it gives you a uh, very precise measurement of, temp of effective temperature, of surface gravity, but not all the stars are observed by Apogee. Then you have two mass that is uh, looking at the infrared, and this is also a uh, uh, um, uh, great uh, information. So uh, not all galaxies in Gaia and Apogee are in two mass. So if you train an algorithm to take one star and just predict from one part of the of, for instance, from the Gaia coefficient, you try to predict uh, the temperature one time. Then you go to the two mass colors and then predict the gravity. In each direction, you take a couple of uh, a set of input and predict a set of output. But here, it's completely different the philosophy from what we saw at the beginning, where you have the input and the output. Here, everything is input and output at the same time. So then the network can have a, a more general idea of how all those things are related. So they prove that actually uh, you, you, you have a star, then you put a context that will be similar to a prompt where you write in, 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 a, in a large language model. This context is provided by the data availability that you have in the moment. Let's say I only have guide observation and then try to request something that is the temperate. But you can go the other way around. You can, uh, okay, I, I know the temperature of the star, I know the gravity, um, and I want to know how the spectrum look like, right? So then you can start understanding why, which features of the spectra are important for, for those quantities. So this is uh, so when I saw this paper, I, I I thought that this can be applied to to galaxies as well. So this is uh, some of the ongoing project that I'm working now. So the idea is um, to take data from multiple surveys. Um, so we can take data from Sloan, from DESI, from JPAS, from Euclid, and, and build a, a training set that works on the union and you get a set of physical properties that you're interested in. So imagine I want the red seed. So if I want the red seed, I take the red seed from, from the, from the uh, surveys that measure the red seed in the best possible way. So this is Desi as long. Then I want to state the stellar mass. If I want the stellar mass, maybe I can, I can go to j pass because uh, it's photometry. So for galaxies with with very low continuum, I might get a better estimate of the mass. And then if I want the initial lines, again, I go to spectra. So um, 
So yeah, like they, this is this is the idea to to try to build a model that do everything at the same time. So you get progressive, you get the initial lines, you get a star formation rate, you get all the information you can uh, uh, you you would like to have. Uh, those are some results. This is very very preliminary. So I think this is a piece of sound. But uh, I took a Sloan and Galax just just to, to give it a try and and use those uh, transformer models to to predict uh, the initial lines, uh, also the red, the, the photo red set, uh, as you see here. Um, so this is actually it's it's a Sloan. So with a Sloan, I produced JPAS data and also Galax data and try to. Yeah, to do predict those quantities, also like from the optical, try to predict the ultraviolet. This is something you can try. It's not uh, working super good now, but as I said, this is preliminary. And yeah, this is what is going on now in the in the field. Some a little bit biased, but this is what what I could present. And uh, yeah, I leave you with. With a conclusion, maybe you want no questions. Thank you very much. Questions for Ines? So, for people in Zoom, you can raise your hand virtually. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. It's been great. I know nothing about this, and, and I think now I know more. So, uh, great stuff, great job. I have two questions. Um, we may be lucky, but I know nothing, so I can ask them anyway. Uh, one of them is that if you, I guess you do, but can you do exactly the same for simulation, like massive simulations that you want to extract some properties? Uh, I don't know, I can think of like many cosmological simulations and, and trying to, to, to extract information from there. The, the follow-up question would be that is that simpler than with observations? Is more complicated? Can you be biased because of the model that you're using in the simulations? Yeah, yeah, indeed. There, there are people that are actually um, training on simulation and derive some physical properties, and then with this training, they go to uh, to real observation and try to to do prediction. As you said, that this the, the problem of training with simulation precisely that it can be biased toward the simulation. Um, so this is, this is a, a big problem in, in, in the field. And, and this is what I talked just uh, in the end, that this transformer idea is good because you can train at the same time with simulation and real data. So you don't need the, the cross match. So you can train simultaneously. So this can fill the gap between simulation and uh, real data. But there are many works that do that. Train the simulation and then goes to Observation. I guess like another follow up is that could, could this uh, neural network or this AI in particular give you a hint of say, hey, look, you're looking for correlation with mass, redshift, whatever, but look, there is something here that you may want to have a look because I found it that there is something here that is that nothing? Did you find anything that you did not expect? Um, as, can, can you, can you find you're looking for correlation with mass, colors, and redshift, mm -hmm. right? Three properties. But then maybe there is a fourth correlation that you, the human didn't even think of. But the AI, the AI is telling you, look, I found this theory. I don't know what physical meaning has, but maybe you as a human can tell me. Yeah, I think like uh, yeah, possibly this is uh, it's actually something that, that happened. But uh, yeah, nowadays I think uh, we are still are uh, useful. Like uh, we need to go to the data interpret the what's the Italian Italian the last, but maybe in the future we still don't need that. Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, yes. Uh, could you look, please look at the previous slide? This one. That, uh, <laughs> do, do you have any idea why the uh, prediction is worse for smaller sledges? Uh, no, I don't have this. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you mean worse because there is more scatter here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. This, this is just something that finished this weekend, in fact. So, um, I hardly expect the data. This is something we have to look at. Super preliminary. I can't uh, give you an answer now. Okay. Any questions? 
I wouldn't know the, the, the nature of these sort of techniques. I know that one of the, 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 the has been made one of the limitations is the, the size of the training sample. So you're working with the, the very large catalogs. Uh, are those enough? Yeah, that, I mean, that's one, one other question. And the other thing is how can you prevent the biases that we have from the, the sort of catalog we have? So in, in that sense, we are in dealing with something which is similar what happens with models. There can be, the, the, you need to control the, 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 the inputs to see that mm -hmm. they are forcing any bias or hallucination. Mm -hmm. I think calling it for something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. Um, yes, yes, I mean, that? yeah, like the training set is everything. Like it's, I think it's even more important than than the, the algorithm that you use. This is what makes the the, the, the availability of knowledge, right? So, um, so yeah, like all the effort has to be put in how you build the training sets. But in any case, like when you build this kind of algorithm, those are good for like great samples when you want uh, to to have a statistically. Um, information that uh, goes in a statistic way, right? Like if you are interested in a particular object, then you cannot use this technique. Like you have to go to the traditional way of analyzing this data because you, you don't want just a statistical answer. So in this sense, like those models are great when, when you analyze big samples. But this is this is true to a certain extent because uh, in the work that I, I saw you about Khalifa, we trained algorithm with with 900 galaxies, this is, I mean, comparing with all those, the, the amount of data that you, you use to, to train those machines is not a lot. So, but yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, like the training set is, it's, uh, it's everything. So you have to, to be, you have to spend a lot of time trying to understand this training set and trying to build it in, in the best possible way, because this is what you're going to make the success uh, later on. Because there is also another limitation here is that I, I, I am not an expert on the field, but I know that in the normal when you use supervised neural networks, mm -hmm. those are good for interpolation, but not for extrapolation. So, I mean, if you go for a higher redshift, you are at a lot. What happens in the case? In here, yep. I would say it's happened the same. So, they are not able to extrapolate. In the same way that ChatGPT is not able to extrapolate. Any questions? Anything else? So the, the conclusion is that we human beings are still needed, right? Yeah, for some time. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, yes, let's thank Ness uh, again. Thank mm -hmm. you.